Hello, everybody. I'm Mr. Danahauer, and today I'm going to be talking to you about waves. Waves are really just a transfer of energy. So as we embark on our unit of energy, uh, where we're going to be discussing all types of energy, waves uh, represent one kind of energy, and we can see that in multiple different ways. So in order to uh, work through our questions and stuff today, I recommend that you take out these notes. And if you don't have those, if your teacher hasn't provided those for you, then you uh, can just write this information on your own paper. We're going to be going through this slideshow today. And so you'll notice on your note sheet that the um, different slides are numbered. And so each of those will have a few questions that we'll go through. And the first thing that we want to understand is the anatomy of a wave. So just like if you talk about the anatomy of an animal or a person, a wave sort of has an anatomy and there's some terminology we need to know with this. So this picture, for number one, this picture is showing a wave. Um, this is actually a transverse wave and we'll get to that in just a minute. So uh, what's the definition of a wavelength here? We can see that a wavelength is simply the distance of one cycle of a wave. So we can measure that from the crest to the crest, or the trough to the trough, or where the wave crosses the baseline. That's what the sort of the x-axis of this is called, the baseline, where it crosses the baseline and does a full cycle back to where uh, it hits the baseline uh, further down. So any of those represents the wavelength. And we use a special Greek symbol called lambda which kind of looks like a Y uh, fell over and is upside down. So if you draw an upside down Y, that's benoting or showing the wavelength of a wave. We'll talk more about wavelength because wavelength is one of the main characteristics we use to classify and talk about the different kinds of waves. Okay, so that's wavelength. The next part of the anatomy of the wave is called the amplitude. <clears throat> The amplitude of a wave is the distance from the baseline, which, as I said in the last slide, was uh, that x-axis, uh, and, and the distance from that baseline to either the crest or the trough. We won't talk a whole lot about amplitude, but I will tell you if uh, you turn the volume up on your phone, if you're listening to music, you're increasing the amplitude of the waves that you're listening to. Uh, but again, we won't talk about amplitude a whole lot. You do need to know the def like what amplitude is and be able to um, you know, label that on a wave. Uh, but we're not going to directly describe wave amplitude a whole lot. Okay. Um, so next we're going to talk about frequency. And I have two waves. The first question is, what does frequency actually mean? And if we just think about the term frequent or fre you know, how frequently does something happen, we're, we're talking about how often does that thing occur. Um, and so you might think about on a daily basis, what are some things that happen frequently? Well, you, you, know, you brush your teeth every day, um, you eat, those happen frequently, uh, those kinds of things. And the same is true when we talk about the frequency of a wave, but we want to define that as how many cycles of the wave pass a certain point every second. And we use special units for this called hertz, and the units are labeled HZ, capital H, lowercase z. Um, let's take a second, and uh, for the first wave, <clears throat> excuse me, the red wave on top, let's actually calculate the frequency, how many cycles pass per second. Now, I'm going to start my timer, and I'm going to time this for 10 seconds, and we're going to see how many waves pass in 10 seconds. And marks. Get set, go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so my timer stopped and then nine waves passed every 10 seconds. So let's go ahead and calculate what then is the frequency of that red wave. It's cycles per second. So nine cycles of the wave passed in 10 seconds. We would label that, or we could divide that out so we get actual cycles per second, and we're going to get 0.9 cycles per second. But we don't label it cycles per second, we actually label it with hertz. So it would be 0.9 hz, which stands for 
cycles per second. Okay, let's go ahead and go back to um, another wave here. And we want to compare these two waves now. Let's calculate. We'll do the same thing for this wave, the blue wave. So we'll start our timer, and I'll start counting right now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Okay, stop. So we had seventeen cycles uh, in ten seconds. So let's go ahead and calculate what that would actually be. So again, we have seventeen cycles in 10 seconds and if we divide that up we get 1.7 hertz or cycles per second so which one which wave has a higher frequency here the one on the bottom okay that blue wave had a higher frequency than the red the red wave did the one that was on the top and that's going to be important because just like i said where we use wavelength to describe waves a lot, we also use the term frequency to, to describe and categorize different types of waves. One thing you should also notice is that the wavelength of the red wave is much larger. The wavelength of the blue wave is much smaller. So we can see here that actually there's what we call an inverse relationship between wavelength and frequency. Really big wavelengths have a small frequency, okay, because it it takes longer for those waves to pass a certain point. Really small wavelengths have a higher frequency. They're going to have more cycles pass per second. If we assume that those waves are traveling at the same speed, of course. So we'll get into that inverse relationship in just a minute. So again, if you haven't defined frequency for number six yet, frequency is uh, how many cycles of a wave pass a certain point every second. And the units we use for that are Hertz, which is capital H, lowercase z. So now we're going to look at a couple of different types of waves. It's not, there's not just one type, there's multiple types of waves, and we want you to know the differences between the types of waves, some key differences that we see. So here I'm showing you a longitudinal wave on slide four. An example of a longitudinal wave would be sound waves. So as I'm talking right now, my vocal cords are compressing and expanding, they're vibrating, and that's causing the air, which we would call the air the medium that the wave is traveling through. The air is, uh, is actually being compressed and expanded at certain points. And so where we see a lot of these uh, compression points, all right, and then expansion points here, those are kind of the different waves that we're seeing pass through. Now, one of the things that we want to notice about the waves is how are the particles moving? Really, all a wave is, is just moving particles in, in terms of a longitudinal wave and a transverse wave. These particles are just moving back and forth. So if we look here at this little dot, what's it actually doing in the wave? And we'll just pretend like that's a molecule in the air, maybe an oxygen or nitrogen molecule. If we follow it, it's just moving back and forth moving back and forth. So as it gets bumped, right, it, the energy gets transferred from that particle in the air, and it moves a little bit, and then it returns back to where it was. So really, we just see these particles moving back and forth. Now, what direction is the wave going here? The wave, I'm going to trace with my cursor here, the wave is going this direction. How are the particles moving compared to the wave direction? Well, the wave is moving this direction, the particles are also moving this direction. So in terms of math, how do we describe two lines that are moving the same way, right? We call that parallel. So um, the particles in a longitudinal wave move parallel to the direction of the wave. You should write that down. The particles in a longitudinal wave move parallel to the direction of the wave. I always like to have ways to remember this stuff. And so if we're thinking about a longitudinal wave, okay, notice that what, what symbol do we use in math to show something is uh, longitude or is uh, sorry parallel? Uh, we use these two lines, right? We, that means parallel in math. 
Well, notice in our longitudinal word, we have two L's the beginning and the end. And I apologize for my handwriting. I'm writing straight up on my screen. It's a little tough. So again, we can use that to help us remember that in a longitudinal wave, the wave direction and the particle motion are parallel to each other. Okay. So again, um, on number, I already mentioned this, but on number three, it's asking, uh, sorry, it's saying, what is a wave? And it's really just a transfer of energy. It could be a transfer of energy through the motion of particles, right? So waves are really just a transfer of energy. Okay, let's move on to our next type of wave. That's going to be called a transverse wave. Transverse waves move a little bit differently than longitudinal waves do. If we look at a transverse wave, and I have two examples here for you, all right, we can see uh, if we follow one of these particles, let me bring my pointer up here. I'm just going to pick a dot here, and I'm going to try to follow it. They're kind of fast. These particles are moving up and down. And in this wave, it's a little hard to tell which direction the wave's going, if it's going this way or that way. But the wave direction is like this. The particle motion is like this. So how would we describe that movement? In a transverse wave, the particle motion is perpendicular to the motion of the wave. We can see that down here as well. The wave seems to travel this direction. And if we watch one of the points on the wave, one of the um, particles that are a part of the wave, we can see they move perpendicular to the way that the wave is actually going. And again, there's a good way to remember this. If we look at the word transverse, uh, what's the math symbol that we use to show that two lines are perpendicular to each other? We use the upside down T. And so if we take our T for transverse and we flip it over, that's a good reminder to us that the particles in a transverse wave move perpendicular to the direction of the wave motion. I'm an example of a transverse wave. We have a few examples. Water waves kind of move like transverse waves. Um, the water is the medium that the wave, the energy is traveling through. So we get a water molecule that goes up and then it comes back down and it goes up and it comes back down. And all those water molecules are kind of pushing on each other, transferring that energy. Um, another example besides a water wave for transverse waves would be some seismic waves created by earthquakes. Some of the seismic waves are transverse waves. Um, also, light waves kind of behave like transverse wave, more so than longitudinal, but we'll look at those in more detail in just a little bit here. So, um, take a second for number three and jot down a complete sentence that compares the particle motion and wave direction in transverse versus longitudinal waves. It might look something like this. Particles in a longitudinal wave move parallel to the direction of the wave and particles in a transverse wave move perpendicular to the direction of the wave. Here I just have a couple of uh, examples of waves. On the top I have an example of a water wave and you can see um, that it's mostly like a transverse wave but the particles do kind of roll a little bit and so the particle motion is not exactly perpendicular. And then a seismic wave underneath that on the bottom here Again, we see mostly an up and down motion, but there's a little bit of side to side. So this behaves, the seismic wave would behave mostly like a uh, transverse wave. Let's talk about a third type of wave now. Uh, these are called electromagnetic waves, which a lot of times we just call light waves. Um, but <clears throat> how is this wave different? First of all, it looks like a, a transverse wave, right? Kind of that up and down motion, if we look at the arrows. Um, but the uh, difference here is that an electromagnetic wave is actually composed of two waves traveling together, an electric wave and a magnetic wave, or we could call it an electric field and a magnetic field. Those two travel together. That gives us a very unique property for electromagnetic waves. Because they travel together in a pair, they do not need a medium to travel through. So on number three, the most important difference between an electromagnetic wave and transverse or longitudinal waves um, is that they do not need a medium to travel through. Electromagnetic waves can travel through nothing. Where do electromagnetic waves come from? They come from 
um, the sun, right? We get a lot of electromagnetic radiation that comes from the sun. How does that, all of that light energy, okay, all the different types of waves that are coming from the sun, how do they get to the earth? Well, they travel as electromagnetic waves. So they're able to travel through the emptiness, the void of space. Our other waves have to have some kind of a medium to travel through, whether it's water or even rock for seismic waves or um, air for sound waves. There has to be some medium for them to travel through, but not electromagnetic waves. They can travel through nothing. One other unique property of electromagnetic waves is they all travel at the same speed. You probably have heard of this before, and we call it the speed of light, which is really fast. The speed of light is uh, 300 million meters per second. And I'll write that number down for you. You should write this number down because we're going to be using it some in our activities that we do in the future here. So all light travels at 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And we could look that up in miles per hour. Again, it would be really fast. Um, this number represented in standard form would look like this. Okay, so 3 times 10 to the 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 meters per second. That's pretty fast. All right, now, um, the electromagnetic waves, uh, there's not just one kind. We have multiple kinds of electromagnetic waves. So we're going to look at that now, and we wanted to be able to describe um, all of these types of waves in terms of their frequency, their wavelength, and their energy. So you'll notice down here, I've got frequency shown, and I have wavelength shown. We don't have energy on this diagram, but I will tell you that low frequency means low energy, and high frequency means high energy. So the first question here is list the seven types of electromagnetic waves. We can see that we have radio waves, right? There's, there's uh, seven different kinds of waves or categories of electromagnetic waves, depending on their energy and their frequency and wavelength. So take a second to list those out, radio waves, microwaves, infrared waves, visible light, which is the only type of waves that our eyes are able to see. And you can see we have that broken down from red, orangey, biv, the colors of the rainbow, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and then violet. Then we have our higher energy waves, ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. So let's uh, just interpret this diagram a little bit. What kind of electromagnetic waves have the shortest wavelength? Well, down here we have a big wavelength compared to down here where we have a short wavelength. So our very shortest wavelength is going to be our gamma rays. The highest uh, wavelength, the longest wavelength, is going to be our radio waves. And if we're just looking at the visible spectrum here, the biggest wavelength in the visible spectrum is going to be the red waves, and the shorter wavelength in the visible is going to be the violet or purple. So what kind of electromagnetic waves have the lowest frequency? If we look at frequency here, remember as I when we were talking about wavelengths, if you have a big wavelength, that's a low frequency. If you have a small wavelength, that's a big frequency. So down here are... Um, lowest frequency waves are going to be our radio waves. So again, what's the relationship between frequency and wavelength? Um, this is called an inverse relationship. We use that term in math a lot. When one variable increases, and then that causes another variable to decrease, and they move in opposite directions of each other, we call that an inverse relationship. We can see that if you have a big wavelength, the frequency is low. As the wavelength gets smaller, the frequency gets higher. So that is an inverse relationship between frequency and wavelength. Again, we're going to use energy, frequency, and wavelength to describe all of these waves quite a bit. And in the future, we'll talk more about the electromagnetic spectrum. So what kind of EM waves have the most energy? That's not shown on here but I'm telling you that gamma rays have the highest energy. 
And so then the lowest is going to be our radio waves. They have lower energy. And if we think about once we get into the ultraviolet range, um, there's enough energy in these waves to actually harm us, right? Ultraviolet rays uh, come from, we get those through the atmosphere and they penetrate through and make it down and hit us on our skin. And that can actually cause things like skin cancer when those high energy ultraviolet waves pass through your dead layers of skin and make it down into your live skin cells and hit the DNA. You can get mutations and that can cause cancer. We use x-rays to penetrate through actually all the way through our body's tissues. They have enough energy to do that and that's how we get x-rays for like the dentist or if you break your arm or something like that. And gamma rays um, actually are used quite a bit in medicine too. Um, if you've ever known anybody that had a tumor that needed to be shrunk, sometimes um, they'll do radiation therapy which is using sometimes gamma rays to try to destroy those tumor cells. If we're just focused on the types of light, I'm going back to our sheet here on number seven, which color of light has the longest wavelength? Again, as I said, the longer wavelength is over here, and that's going to be red waves. So that means purple has the shortest wavelength of the visible. And then the highest frequency is going to be our purple or violet. The lowest energy, or low energy, is going to also be low frequency here, and that's going to be red light. So let's quickly, um, again, define, like, how is energy related to frequency and wavelength? So if the um, energy goes, uh, or if the frequency of a wave is higher, the energy is also higher. High frequency is high energy. We call that a direct relationship. When the two variables move together, up and up, or down and down, that's a direct relationship. So when energy, when the frequency is higher, Energy is also higher. That's a direct relationship between energy and frequency. I'm answering number eight here, if you didn't catch that. Uh, and then when we talk about energy and wavelength, those are going to have an inverse relationship. Okay. The, the bigger the wavelength, down here where we have a big wavelength, those are going to be our lowest energy waves. As the wavelength gets smaller, the energy is increasing for those waves. So energy and wavelength have an inverse relationship, just like frequency and wavelength have an inverse relationship. So um, you can see uh, there's a lot of uh, you know, terminology and stuff we use to describe these electromagnetic waves, and we'll dig into this a little bit deeper as we move forward. But let's look at um, just a couple of interesting concepts with electromagnetic radiation. What is this slide showing? You've probably seen this happen before where you have a a glass somewhere and the sunlight's shining in and you see um, this process of the white light which is composed of all of the colors of the rainbow being refracted or um, bent into this rainbow. So whenever that light hits the prism it's transitioning from one medium, the air, into another medium, the glass, and then back into the air again. Every time those waves uh, transition from one medium to another they're going to get bent a little bit and they get bent a little bit differently depending on the wavelength. And we call that process refraction, not reflection. Reflection is when the light just bounces off at an angle. Refraction is when the light gets bent as it passes through a different medium. And here I'm going to zoom in on that just a little bit. On the next slide, this is slide 10, the last one. Here's that white light coming in to the prism. And I want you to see what's happening here as it comes in, all the wavelengths are working together, right? They're all at the same time. We see all the different colors of light in the visible spectrum. But as they travel from here into the prism, they actually get bent. And we can see that um, the red light does not get bent quite as much as the purple light. So the, the smaller wavelength of light actually gets bent more or refracted more and each color is bent a little bit differently. And so that's why whenever a light passes through a prism or for a rainbow that we see out in nature, as it passes through the little droplets of water, it actually refracts and it causes those colors to split out so we can see all the different colors of the rainbow. Um, so uh, we can see, just a review here, the violet refracts the most and the red refracts the least, bends the least. And so we would say the relationship is that the smaller the wavelength, the more the refraction or the more that the bending happens. That would be an inverse relationship, right? Um, small wavelength, bigger refraction. 
So I hope um, from this lesson, you've learned a few things. One, the anatomy of a wave that we've looked at together. So you should be able to label um, the amplitude and the wavelength of a wave. You should also be able to calculate the frequency like we practiced a few slides ago. You should also be able to tell us the difference between a transverse and a longitudinal wave and give some examples of those. Lastly, you should be able to tell us what's different about electromagnetic waves compared to other transverse and longitudinal waves. And then, of course, the differences between the electromagnetic waves, uh, in including describing their frequency, wavelength, and energy. That's all we have today. Hope you have a great day, and Sco Ridge!